Well, I'd just like to introduce uh, Dr. Kevin Stoddard from the uh, Actor Interlock School of Social Work at the University of Toronto. And you are one of the advisors to the Correct. advisory group? Correct. So you're second level advisor. That's right. So that's, that's right. Uh, and I'm going to turn it over to Kevin to introduce the session panel itself. So welcome everybody and I uh, look forward to an interesting session. Thanks. Thanks very much, Tim. And uh, thanks to uh, UBC and uh, the Centre for Inclusion and Citizenship uh, for, uh, for having yes. not the main speaker today, uh, not the speaker that you've come to hear. Uh, as we heard from the Vancouver Sun yesterday, uh, the article written, Autism has found a brave new voice, its own. Since its inception only a few years ago, I've been thrilled to work with the Advisory Committee of Adults on the Spectrum, the official name, Tim, a committee of Autism Society Canada. As somebody who's been connected with the field of autism for 25 years, this work has been, and probably will continue to be, one of the most significant projects I've been involved with in my career. Like individuals with other so-called disabilities or disorders, Individuals with autism spectrum disorders have been excluded from being active and involved citizens throughout history, around the globe, but more significantly here in Canada. The problem of exclusion, however, has been more chronic and more unnoticed for individuals with ASDs compared to individuals living with other conditions. In a sense, it has been easy for us to exclude individuals with ASDs because at the core of their condition is poor or even total lack of communication. The second feature, as you will hear later, is difficulty interacting with others, sometimes leading to extreme social isolation. The disorder itself has provided an easy excuse for our exclusion because of difficult or different behavior and responses to sensory input, we have excluded through institutionalization. We have excluded through over-medication, restraint, and other forms of punishment. We have told individuals with ASDs that they need to be fixed or that they need to be cured. The intent of some clinical sciences has been to eradicate all traces of autism. In fact, who individuals with autism are? You can only wonder what messages people with autism get about their so-called acceptability to the rest of us, society. Exclusion has extended to organizations, even autism organizations, to research and to academia. So, it is especially poignant today that people with autism spectrum disorders are speaking at an academic institution. Who better than those with restricted range of interests, an ability to sift through reams of data, and without the cumbersome restraints of social interaction to be at a university setting? A number of years ago, Autism Society Canada took a brave new step to begin to change a sad state of affairs. Provinces and territories, which are member societies of ASC, nominated adults with autism spectrum disorders to sit on a national advisory committee. Since that time, the committee has advised the national organization on issues pertaining to adults and other individuals with ASDs. We have sought advice on the content of our website and on policy directions. Our members have even spoken on Parliament Hill. The committee has published the first ever paper in Canada written by individuals with ASDs about services they need. Believe it or not, this is the first time that people with ASDs have been asked about their needs, not what we think they want or they need. Provinces, territories, and our federal government now need to begin to listen. 
services for adults with autism are neither accessible nor appropriate to their needs. Unemployed adults who are marginalized, experiencing mental health problems and other social and economic issues have been given few resources and are forced to either pay for capable services in Ontario, for instance, or suffer with none. The waste of human potential is striking. One of our aims has been to begin to have a cross-fertilization of ideas between researchers, most of them neurotypical, and individuals with ASDs. Again, this has been a first in Canada. We met a number of researchers in Toronto and the committee was invited to the CIHR sponsored conference held by the Canadian Autism Research Network, or CARIN. Long the subjects of the researchers' gaze, adults and individuals with autism are now participating in forming a research agenda that is uniquely Canadian. This is exciting. Most significant, significantly in working with the advisory committee, we have all been changed. We have benefited as an organization, as individuals, as professionals, and as parents. Their narratives, as you will hear today, are sobering, instructive, and poignant. Take the time to listen to really listen and be moved, and then take action. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Christian Hooker. He'll start today, uh, and Christian is our representative from Manitoba. All right. Good evening, or good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as you can see, my... Oh. oh. There we go. <laughs> well, first of all, I'd like to thank the University of British Columbia for inviting me and the advisory community to come speak to you today. Um, as you can see, I'm from Selkirk, Manitoba, and I am also the chair of the advisory committee for Autism Society Canada. Uh, before, uh, one of the things I'm going to talk about uh, is talk about the important characteristics and behaviors you might see of a child on the autism spectrum. The first, first case I'm going to bring is a five-year-old on the autism spectrum. He spoke about 60 words, he screamed a lot, ran away from classes, poor attention span, was very isolated, um, and, poor eye, and poor eye contact. And um, what you're going to notice is that this would be somebody who was highly affected with autism. Um, we're talking about, and one of the things we're talking about is like, you know, terms and things like that. I personally am not a big fan of high functioning or low functioning because that's more, because those are more kind of open to interpretation from like an observer who watches somebody who's, and I feel, I feel uh, saying highly affected or lowly affected is more of like a personal thing. It's like I would consider myself mildly affected with autism and from observation and from, and I would say this one, this is a child, an example of someone who would be highly affected by autism. Now, and now I'm going to show you, talk about some of the characteristics and behaviors of a particular 12-year-old on the autism spectrum. This 12-year-old was an honor roll student in junior high. He played in a school band, was an active member of the chess club, part of the junior high drama team, and was part of the circle of friends. This is an example of somebody that I would consider mildly affected on the autism spectrum. And now, and now we've got to discuss the importance of these two children. The main importance is to show like the broad perspective, like autism can be like you know, highly affected, like low vocabulary, like poor social cues, and very isolated. And then there's the mildly affected, who like is great in school and can like be part of active groups and socially interact. Now you may notice that I the word different is in quotations, and that's actually because you know while they seem like two different children, the fact of the matter is they're actually, they're actually both representing the same child on the autism spectrum. Me. That was me when I was, those are just characteristics of myself when I was 5 and 12. So not only do I show the different ranges, it also shows that early childhood behaviors like from the 5 year old doesn't necessarily mean that the 5 year old is going to grow up to be like have poor social conversations, to be very isolated, 
they could grow up and have a lot of uh, good potential. They could have the potential to accomplish anything. And now, at 25, I'm a fourth-year student at the University of Winnipeg. I'm a director of large for Autism Society of Manitoba and Autism Society of Canada. I'm chair of the advisory committee here at Autism Society of Canada. I've helped start. I'm also a guest children's sermon presenter at the at my Selkirk Evangelical Lutheran Church, and as well as performing services when the pastor was unavailable. Um, also the co-founder of Yamen, which is Young Adults in Manitoba Autism Network, which is a Manitoba advisory committee for Autism Society Manitoba. And I'm also, I've also started running social skills groups for young kids on the autism spectrum, which I will get to in a little bit. So now I want to talk about some of the struggles that I had throughout my school years and childhood. Uh, in my elementary school years, there, not everybody knew my understanding of spoken language or understood why I had certain phobias of common things. A lot of teachers were kind of, are still kind of, still scratching their heads wondering why I was like, you know, I seemed fine when I first came to school, but then when we started playing Old Canada at 9 o'clock, they saw me running around the halls trying to escape the, <laughs> the blaring music coming from nowhere, coming from out of, I also had this interpret. I also had this belief everybody could read minds because they knew when it was time to line up or change subjects. I, w I was in elementary school before they started implementing the bells or buzzers at every 45 minutes to say that it's class change. So, you know, basically it was just the teacher would look at the clock and like say, "Oh, it's time to go." But then I didn't quite pick up on that, so it was a little confusing. It was very confusing at times. Substitute teachers was also a thing because I had a problem with uh, sudden changes and you know substitute teachers can kind of come to the school unexpected, you never know when you're going to have a sub, so that kind of caused great anxiety. I never quite knew how to react to specific substitutes. I also had this belief that not working hard in class not getting, meant not getting the perfect marks, so, and this caused great anxiety when I had to do new work, trying to keep up with everybody. and. And, Mary, and many various struggles throughout the school years, like through elementary, carried on through high school, like not being taught various manners and behaviors that kids may display. This was, uh, you know, I hear a joke in, the, in elementary school in the, in the schoolyard that I think is funny, but then I tell the teacher, and all of a sudden I'm getting uh, scrutinized for it because it's not, exactly the it's not exactly the kind of joke you tell a teacher or an adult. <laughs> And there was some unpredictable school behavior from students and staff, like the substitutes that I mentioned, and the transitions from elementary to junior high, the class changes, the interest changes, and it's not all the same. As and um, now, how I overcame some of these obstacles, like the phobia of life singing, like O Canada, that I kind of alluded to. Um, what some of the things that helped me was. I was given taped music to listen to when the class went, so I would just listen to music on my own. Uh, the biggest thing that actually helped me was the Be Like Jay. Jay is my older brother, and like any little kid in, in elementary school, I wanted to do everything my big brother was doing. And one day when I was in the hall with my EA, I heard, I saw, I peeked in the music room and I saw my brother just singing with the class and participating like he was supposed to, and it kind of clicked that if I wanted to be like Jay, I'd have to somehow overcome my fear of music and start participating in the music room. So, um, I, so, I started, so it started slow. I mean, it was just listening to tape music in the, the class. Like, you know, I was, first I just started outside the hall, I was just kind of listening to music, and then eventually, eventually I started listening to the music in the class, and then I eventually got into the class and was participating like I was supposed to. And it would evolve, and in junior high, I was, in high school, I was part of the junior symphonic band, the senior symphonic band, the senior choir, and then I took my interest outside the school and went into the community choir and church choir. There was a great misunderstanding of speech in the classroom, like uh, a lot of, a lot of things that, a lot of biggest thing that happened was like educational videos were a big problem because sometimes they would re the videos would go by a little too fast, and I wouldn't capture everything so what helped me was getting the close captioning so I would just kind of because I could I could my eyes could process written information a lot faster than my ears could process verbal information so I would just I would just read the notes as it was taking place and and I had a, and it was perfect now I'll, now I'm just trying to implement a plan where um, the whole world is close captioned or has a little something <laughs> like that. then everything would just be peachy keen. <laughs> 
journals for school also help like with me, my parents, and the teachers kind of keeping up to date on homework and other out of the ordinary school activities so nothing became a surprise. So my parents knew and they would tell me about it. And um, the social skills groups, this is sort of more outside the school settings, but it helped me interact with other children on the autism spectrum who may have had, who were having some of the same social structures as I, social struggles as I was. And, and it was just kind of, and it was great interacting with kids that had many of the same interests as I did. And um, now some of the struggles I have growing up. The biggest one was probably new experiences in the world. Like I, this is more sort of something I kind of placed on myself, but some other other adults on the spectrum might have a more direct experience, and this would be uh, the struggles of like being the new guy or the young guy. Like I remember having. Like I know there's some people from ASC who might be a little surprised here, but I was actually very shy and, and you know I didn't really feel too comfortable at first being part of things there because I just started and I was getting into a field where like everybody had like years more experience than this and I was and I was kind of like thinking like who am I to kind of like say anything because I mean everybody else probably knows more about this than I do so so. I mean, even though the AAC was great for like making me feel welcome, it was just more something more in my mind that was was a problem. Language and communication still <coughs> provide a problem, so even uh, especially like things like emails and text because um, because the messages don't exactly have like those tones of voices like written, so you might hear something that might sound like a <coughs> compliment, but it <coughs> may have been sarcasm or things like that, and. Another thing that was a problem was disability service that I had from the government that were reduced or canceled if any money was made, and this was really hard for when I was when I was doing part-time work at a retail store because if I felt like taking that extra shift on a Saturday or taking an extra evening shift, that I'd have to report that, and then the money, and then all of a sudden all the services were being can were being canceled. It wasn't just like the money; they were also cutting out the health and dental services, which you know, I didn't have a problem with like the money because I was making more money, but they didn't even provide. They they just it was more of an all or nothing type things, and that was. And university expenses were also a bit of a problem, but I think I think we can all kind of relate to university expenses kind of being a little hefty at times. <laughs> so while the uh, scholarships and student loan forms were still pending, I was remaining dependent or dependent on the BMD, the Bank of Mom and Dad, as I call it, <laughs> and. A lot of things that were also an issue were uh, sensory things like filtering out background music and sounds. That's more of a thing that's happened throughout childhood and my adult years. How I overcame these, um, part, part of what helped me get over the new guy or young guy conflict was I just had someone familiar with me in the initial beginning stages, whether it was a parent, a friend, or colleague, somebody like the advisory committee for sure helped me kind of get me more comfortable into my into my shell because I was just because you know I because I was familiar with Dr. Stoddard and everybody else in the advisory committee and it just kind of made me feel more comfortable to, to participate in ASC activities so things like that um, email also helps kind of keep me up to date with certain things there I mean if like if basically if we had calls all the time from like the from ASC and the advisory committee on up to date I probably would just probably forget it the next day. Fortunately, we have the emails, which keeps me up to date. And then things that, what helps me, the disability service provided by the government, what helped me was uh, the, the University of Winnipeg has, uh, was great in helping me, the disability service coordinator was great with helping me uh, look for different services that could help me find with study grants and student loans that didn't affect the services I was already receiving. So. So yeah, the disability services in Winnipeg in the U of W were very helpful. And now I'm going to talk about the, uh, the latest endeavor that I've gotten into, which are the social skills groups. I recently, uh, basically, it just started with some some parents heard about you know what I was like heard about um, just being me being part of the advisory groups and her, and you know they had a child on the autism spectrum who was going through some of the same struggles as I <coughs> was having as a child, so they asked me to if I would work do a little program or something with them and so I agreed and then apparently word got out that I was doing this and more parents were, were asking for my help so I 
agreed to that and we started running social skills groups and many of the skills I've taught so far is things on like how to be a friend, conversation cues, like the verbal and nonverbal ones, dealing with peer pressure and bullying. I've been doing this uh, since about, uh, about uh, actually I started in, it's not on the slide, but I actually started March and April like in a formal classroom and then in May and June I started doing them uh, informally in public situations to kind of practice those social skills like we would go to a bowling alley or the park or a marine museum we would just be practicing those good social conversation those so good social skills and now I got a few pictures this one is of here's yeah here's me with like we're just discussing a uh, little weekly homework assignment that I give the kids of how to practice uh, social skills and and we're watching a video from Model Me Kids, which is which is also very great in uh, helping with the <coughs> with teaching social skills. And the parents have taken a real interest in this, and they've wanted to help. And so here's here's us practicing conversation and like good conversation skills, and 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 here's us here's me explaining an activity, and here's the kids practicing this activity. And what I want to, like the point I want to get that I think is really important is the, um, is a mentoring system. Like, not only just like us, but I mean, trying to find maybe people in, in the community, like adults that are on the autism spectrum who, who have done really well that want, that maybe, maybe they want to, maybe we want to reach out to them and, and ask if they want to start a little uh, social skills groups or mentoring program to other kids to kind of help them overcome the same struggles. And I think it's, I mean, it's great for the kids because they have someone they can relate to, someone who's going through the same struggles they have and turn out well. And it's also great for the adults because this also provides a, a meaningful employment opportunity for, for them as well. And, and now I'd like to wrap up my presentation with a uh, poem that I did for the University of Winnipeg in a creative writing class, I had to do a probative poem about uh, which deals with a political, a social, a scientific issue, things of that nature. And I chose to do a poem about what is autism. And so, the way it looks on paper is that if the person who just kind of skims it is just going to notice like the major words, like autism is disabling, needs a cure, socially awkward, sick or barriers, but there's a lot of really fine prints in there that you kind of have to really read, and this is what I consider the voice of the advocacy. So it'll say, autism is often burned by misconceptions that are disabling, autism is misunderstood by intolerance that, need, that needs a cure, or autism is unaccepted by the majority of people to make us feel socially awkward, or autism is a target for abuse, neglect, and cruelty described as sick. And this one, I conclude, is autism is the tool that strengthens, strengthens my voice to abolish these barriers. Mm. Now, uh, speaking is our uh, Quebec representative, Georges Ward. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, I had also because uh, uh, growing up with Asperger syndrome, like Christian, like for Christian, it's not easy. So we can go to the next. Uh, so basically, uh, my childhood was my childhood was marked by problems like lack of common sense, so-called common sense. I was able to know all kinds of insect species, and I was able to know the solar system by heart and all kinds of things like that. But I didn't have the common sense to learn to tie my shoelaces, for example. So that's another one. Or oh, in the, my early childhood, when it was time to learn how to tell time, I had difficulty telling time on an analog clock. But uh, it, when, when I learned to tell time, time became an obsession after. And uh, another thing also, of course, is uh, uh, recognizing emotions. So when I talked non-stop about, non about insects to other, to other children when I was in school, that bored them to death, but I didn't know if they were bored or just listening. <laughs> so, so that's a thing I didn't take for granted. And of course, um, sensory issues like the noise of other kids, for example. I found other kids as noisy when I was a kid myself. So if you work as a social worker, you'll probably get a lot of calls for, from daycare workers who say such and such a kid 
is on is sticking uh, by himself, aligning cars or doing, and not playing with others. And usually, social workers or daycare workers may notice that in, in one of, of their kids that they they're taking care of, and they will call parents to notify them of that, and the parents may call you. So, so that's something that will be quite common when. Uh, Autism is uh, discovered for the first time in the kid. Other things was like stimming, like stimming means to do <coughs> movements, and it looks silly in public for neurotypicals. But uh, and sometimes stimming can increase when the person is tired, when the person is about to do to uh, to have a stressful event, like for some it could be going to the dentist, or others it's public speaking, other could be uh, so s exams. So anything that that is uh, that can cause uh, stress, or new social situations also can just cause stress to a person with autism or Asperger's syndrome if they do do not know how to deal with a new situation. Okay, and sensory issues. When I was like. Four, four years old, when airplanes flew overhead, especially if they flew low, it scared me. The noise of the engine scared me. And I was actually afraid that the airplanes are going to fall out of the sky and hit me. Because, I, uh, because when I was younger, my mom showed me some guys once playing with uh, remote controlled airplanes, and I was like three years old when I saw them. So I thought, Every airplane in the sky was remote controlled. <laughs> and I thought that the, 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 guy, the plane would just fall on me if it ran out of gas or something <laughs> and break on. So I, I was afraid that the, the, to get hit by those. So, it, so I didn't see at first what, what they were. And, and then as one gets older and sees the, the real airplanes for the first time, they have to learn. Because people with Asperger's syndrome sometimes you might have symptoms that are remotely close to Tourette. Like, for example, it will be stronger than you to make a joke that's inappropriate, and you don't say that inappropriate jokes at airports. I'm able to control myself, but children with autism or uh, teenagers with autism will have to be uh, pre-trained uh, about not ever saying any jokes that are inappropriate at airport security. <laughs> because uh, they think it's uh, it's like uh, jokes that couldn't be that were appropriate in the school there, but not appropriate in front of the teacher. But imagine that to a higher scale. So, uh, and uh, another thing also is my special interest also has. Uh, uh, wait, what, what was back on, on the last slide? Because I was uh, I think I didn't finish the last slide. Okay. Okay, what happens is uh, my fear of airplanes when I was uh, growing up eventually became a fascination at one phase, except it wasn't as strong as another guy I know whose name is Gilles Trehin, and he's uh, a person with autism who drew an imaginary city that started out from a passion for airplanes. And the imaginary city, he would make murals of it. Uh, with very, very uh, uh, fine detail about street scenes and buildings and everything. I started out, he wanted to make an airport and then expanded, he, he added a city, a city to the airport. And uh, so myself, I grew up in a family where my mom was more, my, my mom was a single parent's mom and she was obsessed about me uh, making it in life. So. If I stuck too long on things that weren't uh, productive, uh, my mom uh, was worried. <laughs> so uh, she, I had to do something productive. Okay, we'll go to the next one. As I was growing up, uh, living in Montreal, I was exposed to a lot of new things coming. For example, uh, the coming of Expo 67 was an exciting time for me. I mean, because like a lot of people with Asperger's syndrome, I had a fascination with any form of transport, any form of public transit. So one of them was uh, the hovercraft, which was a, a kind of a boat that used uh, an air cushion to navigate quickly across the St. Lawrence River to take people to Expo. 
there was Montreal subway. And a lot of people with autism and Asperger's syndrome can have fascination with subway systems, buses. And uh, there was also uh, a lot of documentaries on, on new and modern transportation. And, uh, and at one time there was something funny, there was also a documentary on flying saucers. And I was watching it with a lot of attention and I, I was asking my mom, what kind of airports do flying saucers use? <laughs> because I thought it was one of the transportation documentaries. Uh, and uh, I, I thought it was about a new kind of transportation, not, not some kind of uh, uh, strange uh, documentary that they sometimes put on TV, like on the paranormal type of stuff. <laughs> and another fascination I have is watches. So, uh, uh, I mean, uh, anything that measures time, of course, I like good science fiction movies where people wear strange watches, like the Minority Report is one of them. <laughs> and, uh, and that special interest, eventually, because I love to, uh, I was fascinated by uh, dates, calendars, counting days, and counting seconds. And uh, uh, that got me interested in learning how to program in BASIC. And uh, I made programs that would count down the days until the summer vacations and things like that. <laughs> it started like that. And the thing is also, special interests at time also has the, uh, the knack of also isolating me from other kids. But I did not find other kids interesting. They were into too much rough and tumble. And... Uh, it, it came to the point that even my gender identity was put into question by some social workers when I was younger because I did not stick around with the boys and do rough and tumble stuff. So that was one of the phases I went through when I was in grade school. And uh, even that was addressed to my mom that I wasn't, uh, I was slow, I was, uh, I, I was slow paced and I was not masculine enough. I wasn't interested in hockey. Uh, I, I wasn't good enough in multitasking to to do team sports. So um, basically, uh, social uh, socializing wasn't very rewarding. So I spent a lot of time in the library reading up on things. I mean, my school had the library open at recess and lunch time, so that was a good escape from all the rough and tumble of the other kids and the bullying and all the nasty things that could happen. And uh, it was rewarding because the books had answers to a lot of my questions. And, and another thing also, my mom was so concerned about my isolation that uh, because I was interested also in insects, she signed me up to a nature club. And that, that's where I learned some social skills with people who share the same interests. They're not necessarily artistic. They are neurotypicals who love nature. And here's another anecdote similar to the school yard anecdote by Christian, is in high school there are fads. And each high school has their own fad. And in my high school we had a cafeteria, but uh, there was no food service to say. It was just to uh, tables, people bought their lunches. And what happened is when people finished their lunches, they had to to crumple their bag and throw it over the shoulder and let it land on the floor. And if, and if the janitor caught you, of course you picked up everyone else's bag. <laughs> so basically it was, the kids like to do things like that. And when I was in the nature club, we went uh, for my first outing and we went to, uh, to a provincial park. And I did the same thing and it wasn't as accepted as it was in high school. <laughs> so, so basically learning that what's acceptable in one context may not be in another. So, so that's one thing that people with Asperger's syndrome may have di difficulty with. So that's why they might tell about uh, inappropriate behavior, for example, uh, uh, telling, to, uh, telling to the minister at your church that you went to Red Beach 
because you find that it's too much of a hassle to dry your bathing suit and things like that, so you prefer red beach. And as a person with Asperger's syndrome, you might see the practicality of things, but not the social acceptability or non-acceptability of things. So, so these are situations that can happen. And another thing also, social issues, one of the things that can be a problem is, for example, in parties. Sometimes people say jokes in parties more often than not, and they might be taken either out of context or they might be, you might be too literal about things. So, or you might spill the beans on things you sh and say things you wouldn't want to say. Another thing is also work situations. Like, I work as a computer tech, so that's the picture of me at work, and this is one of my a secretary that works there, and I helped her with her PC. And I used to have long hair, so if you don't recognize me, uh, <laughs> you know that uh, I've changed over time. So, uh, and, uh, and basically, one of my activities, I mean, uh, I remember a guy who lived in Vancouver, who is a very close friend of mine, and he ha him himself has Asperger's syndrome, and he took part in a charity swim, he swam around Manhattan. And uh, this guy, is, his name is Ben Kramer, and uh, he was very close because we, I knew him since 1982, and at the time, I didn't know exactly what I had. And uh, Ben Kramer, he was, uh, I didn't even know he was autistic, but whatever he had, I mean, he was fascinated by nature, he was fascinated, he did things that were against the grain. I was, I was a bit too chicken to do what he did, like he, he, he climbed 10 story trees to film eagles, he climbed bridges, he was, he was once in trouble because they thought that he was committing suicide, but he was, he was climbing a bridge in New York City with a camera and taking pictures long before 9-11, so basically at the time it, the police didn't think about terrorists, they thought about uh, suicide at the time. Just, which happens a lot in a city known for stress of daily, of daily life. Another thing also is sticking too long on a subject, which, uh, which is uh, one of the difficulties with people with autism or Asperger's syndrome. Yeah, it happens in two instances. For example, you could uh, have a subject that fascinates you. You'll be talking about Swiss watches for a long time and about chronos and uh, stopwatches and all kinds of gizmos. Maybe naming all the movies where you see such and such a watch. Especially James Bond movies are known for showing off watches. <laughs> and, uh, and you could go on and on on that subject. Another reason also that could happen is if something preoccupies you, and it seems too absurd to you, or maybe it's very stressful. For example, in 1976, my mom told me long hair is out of style. <laughs> that was enough for me to talk all the time about hair. And uh, even go to the library and go into the GT section to look up books on the history of hairstyles and how fashions changed. And, uh, and being very stubborn about wanting to change with the fashions, and even today, I mean, for some practical reason, fashion is the other F word. <laughs> <laughs> in French, it also starts with N, which is also a, a, a word in French, which, which is very bad also, that starts with N. <laughs> la, mode, la mode means fashion in French, but there's another French word I won't mention here. <laughs> and, of course, Obsessive about time means like uh, freaking out. I mean, I have, it's almost uh, close to obsessive compulsiveness. And I've learned over time like uh, not to worry if someone's 10 minutes late. And also I've learned to uh, adjust my patience in, in proportion to the conditions of, of waiting. For example, if I'm waiting for someone at a street corner and it's minus 20, I would expect maybe no more than one or two minutes uh, before I leave the corner and go to uh, seek a warm place. However, if, it's a, if I'm waiting in a Starbucks or a place like that where I could use the computer, but wait half an hour, no problem. The guy could come in half an hour late, no problem. However, if it's, uh, so it depends on, on, on 
on the circumstance, but typically I would go into a panic if a person didn't show up at exactly the time I, I, I waited for. And then I had to learn that people are human. And they, they can be late, things can happen, the, train, the subway could, be, uh, could have problems or there could be traffic jams. And even airplanes, flights can be canceled. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, these things happen. And uh, if you don't want to, uh, to suffer a cancel flight, just take the bus. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing also is what helps also is how to make an environment, I'm talking environment in general, like a working environment or a school environment, making it friendly for people with Asperger's syndrome. So what happens is uh, uh, one can split up tasks into smaller subtasks so that the person works on, on a big task one piece at a time, especially in school situations for big assignments where they have a month to hand it in. Uh, teaching the young guy with Asperger's syndrome that you don't hand it, in, uh, hand it in at the last minute. It means you have to work it on it over the period of a month, and then you break it down to do the, the research or whatever, and like you have a phase where you, you gather the information and then you start writing the first chapter, how to make an outline of what you have to do. So a lot of people with Asperger's syndrome have trouble with organizing tasks and things that, that have to be done. And that was my case too. And uh, so I had help when I was in college by another friend to get assignments done on time. That means we had to work on weekends when it was the, at the end of the se semester, so I had to do it because there was a lot of work towards the end of the semester. So everything had to be organized. And uh, sometimes you have to tell them that the context could change when, when the, and the semester ends and there could be more work to be done than at the beginning. So you might have to sacrifice activities like movies or outings that you have, normally have on Saturdays to finish off work. And this usually happens at the last three weeks of school or something. Okay, three more minutes? Okay. And also, of course, explaining social language is very important. Like, uh, because uh, it took me a while to learn about irony and sarcasm. The only thing is I don't decode it immediately. It might take maybe 30 seconds before I decode that something is sarcastic. Whereas neurotypicals see it right away and see it as funny if it's the context is for that. And another thing is uh, to learn uh, emotions sometimes. Uh, sometimes I wonder if, if I should learn about other people's emotions, if I'm told that the world is, uh, people on the metro look uh, sad, depressed, and mean, whereas I tend to have a happy demeanor in terms of, uh, and I, I may be living in my own world in ways because uh, I don't notice other people being stressed or whatever, and uh, to me every day is more or less the same, unless something major happens. But uh, I, I, I tend to live one day at a time. And using special interests to motivate learning and socializing is, is also a good thing. That means when a kid has difficulty reading, you might use his interest in trains. And you find books about trains or things like that to help him learn to read and motivate him into learning to read, for example. And uh, OK, so. Thank you very much. So uh, it's very short 20 minutes because my presentations usually last about an hour and a half when I do it. Uh, but uh, so I had to compress it. Do you want to do the last so, slide, George? Uh, what? You're on the last slide now. OK, OK, I'll do the last slide. OK. So, uh, the, so the conclusion also is uh, that I want to give is with proper ser uh, services, a person with Asperger's syndrome can be truly included as a, a citizen who pays taxes, and that's my case because I work as a computer tech at University of Quebec. And uh, I pay taxes, I don't depend on anyone at this time for services. 
However, there are people who need more services so that they can be more independent. So that's why uh, I tend to lobby for services and they have to be adapted for the individual. There's no one size fit all solution for autism. And uh, another thing that's very important is uh, uh, sometimes a person with Asperger's syndrome can develop good social skills, but they may not be a perfect salesman, for example. So sales may not be a good career for someone with autism. In my case, I, uh, I, I fix computers, I, I do a lot of audiovisual stuff, like to help set up projectors and things like that in classrooms. That's part of my work. And uh, uh, figure out network problems and all kinds of stuff like that. And uh, that's my environment. And I, I also discover new kinds of technologies, new kinds of gadgets. So uh, I find that this work is very motivating. And I'm very happy to come into work every day. I don't wake up stressed in the morning with this job. And uh, so once the person with Asperger's syndrome finds a working environment that's really adapted to him, and in my case, it's a university. It's the University of Quebec at Montreal. I work for the Centre Esquerre, which is a, a modeling, uh, it's a research unit that does uh, climate modeling. And uh, basically, a university, as Tony Atwood once said, is a sheltered workshop for people with Asperger's syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Thanks, George. Okay. I will present Martin Stonehouse, who is from Toronto, and will have a presentation on uh, living with Asperger's syndrome and the gender identity issues. Okay. Hello, my name is Martin Stonehouse, and today I'm going to speak to you on a subject that has not generally been associated with autism and Asperger's. The subject in question is about the intersection between gender identity conflicts and the autistic spectrum. Now I must stop and say here that this is the first time ever that this has been presented anywhere in the world that uh, anyone has done a talk on both these subjects. So um, uh, I want to let people know that. So uh, first off, how many of you know what gender identity is and the difference between it and sexual orientation? Gender identity is about how one feels themselves as either a man or a woman. Sexual orientation is about whom you are attracted to sexually. I won't go into great deals about what makes one sexually attracted to one sex or the other or both, or why another person can feel themselves as the opposite gender to the body they possess, as this alone could take up more than a whole afternoon discussing this topic. But I would like to do a quick experiment with all of you. If you would look at the person sitting next to you, can you tell for sure what gender that, uh, that person really is? We tend to judge people by the way they look and act, but that really does not tell us how that person really feels themselves to be on the inside. So we really don't know what gender the person sitting next to us could be. I'd like to read you a short piece I wrote in 2005 called An Analogy of Why You Cannot Classify a Person's Gender by Their Appearance Alone. Have you ever taken a chocolate from a, an assortment box thinking it was the one you liked, but when you <laughs> bit into it, it was not what you had expected? Like many people, including myself, we judged the chocolate by its appearance without checking the chart that would have shown us that there is a slight difference between the one we wanted and the one we inadvertently chose. If the chocolate left a bad taste in your mouth, consider how embarrassing it would be if you came up to a woman who appeared to be masculine and called her sir. Sometimes we have to look beyond physical appearances to find the real person inside. Transsexual persons are a good example of why we need to look closer before judging and classifying them. Every day a new child comes into this world. After the birth, the doctor does a visual examination and declares that the child either a boy or a girl. How does the doctor know for sure that his decision was correct? Remember the box of chocolates? If one decides by appearance alone, then we could be assigning an improper gender to that child. 
Intersex in infants create a medical challenge that forces us to look beyond physical appearances. One has to look at, the, at other ways to determine gender. Like the chart in the box of chocolates that we should have carefully looked at first, we need to look at what determines one's gender. One way of looking at gender is by our chromosome count. 46XY is male and 46XX is female, or is it? There are medical reports confirming 46XX males and 46XY females, the latter who have given birth to healthy babies. Given the fact that there can be other chromosomal conditions such as Klinefelter syndrome 47XXY, chromosomes might not always be an accurate way of determining one's gender. At least the International Olympic Committee thinks so as they drop mandatory chromosome testing for this very reason. We could then observe how the person acts. However, some women act very masculine and some men act effeminate. If we were to use this method to determine one's gender, it could lead to a lot of trouble. Suppose you determine that an effeminate man must, be, must then be a woman by his very action and called a miss, one could very well be uh, in more than an embarrassing situation and find that box of chocolates planted in her face. <laughs> After cleaning up all that chocolate mess, we are still left with the, the question of what determines one's gender. If gender cannot be determined by physical appearance, genetics, or how one acts, then how do we know what gender a person really is? We must now look at how the person feels inside himself or herself by looking at the neurological and physi physiological aspects of one's personal identity. The person can, then can tell you his or her gender. Only that person can tell you their true gender, and sometimes that does not match one's physical appearance, the way they act, or the chromosome count. Looking into one, how one personally identifies is like finding out what flavor is in the chocolate before you bite into it. So the next time you see a transsexual person, before you make a judgment about their gender, remember the box of chocolates and the choices you make. Just because you chose a chocolate that didn't appeal to you because you neglected to find out more about it, doesn't mean it shouldn't be there. Try another one, perhaps you'll acquire a taste for them. <laughs> and get to know transsexual people and who we are, perhaps you'll come away with a different and positive view of us. Just because we may look a, diff a little different on the outside doesn't mean we're carrying human beings on the inside. So how does this fit into the autism spectrum? In the past number of years, more and more clinicians have been getting a, an upward trend of clients presenting on the autistic, autistic spectrum and identifying with a gender identity conflict. Kevin here has also had some. As time went on, this led led to studies being done and general acknowledgement that there seemed to be a connection between the two conditions based on the number of patients presenting with both conditions. One such study presented by the International Society for Autism Research in 2009 by Dr. ILJ Nolans tested all children and adolescents referred to the Amsterdam Gender Identity Clinic between 2004 and 2007 for signs of an ASD. The results were that 6% of the 233 children and adolescents had an AESD. <clears throat> Their findings were that uh, the co-occurrence uh, co of gender identity conflict and AESD confer, concurs, uh, or occurs frequently. I also wrote a paper in 2003 called Gender Identity Conflicts on the Autistic Spectrum, a Possible Comorbidity, in which I showed a possible link in brain structure differences caused by endocrine disruptors such as diethylstilbestrol, also known as DES, uh, synthetic hormone, and how these uh, changes could relate to both conditions. I also stated that much more research was needed in this field. So now, uh, how does the gender identity conflict on the autistic spectrum look like? Well, there are not many, per uh, many stories out there, so the best example I can give you is from my own appearance. I have Asperger's syndrome and I'm also a transsexual woman. Transsexual. It's like opening a big box of spiders. <laughs> and here comes the big F word, are we ready for it? Fear. <laughs> Many people fear transsexual people because they don't understand us and are afraid to learn more about us. I hope my brief story will help to show that transsexual people such as myself are just ordinary people just trying to make it through life like everybody else. <laughs>